China make it clear that in a whole range of trading areas, Australia is effectively being punished uh, economically for policy decisions that it has made. So we're now dealing with uh, a changed China, which, which causes us to think and to do a range of things. Firstly, we need to think about diversification of our trade. Uh, uh, in, in, a, in a good day, let alone a bad day, too many of our eggs are in the China trade basket, so we need to diversify. That's been crystallised and underlined by COVID, where we're now looking at diversity and security of supply chains and capability in domestic uh, pr production and productivity. Um, so there's that aspect to it, but there's also, how do we now deal with China? Will the Biden administration, for example, bring a more nuanced view to that uh, relationship? Because it remains the case that the signals are sent uh, to the rest of the world from the US-China relationship, and that's been the case for some time. It'll be some time before we see India being essentially the third uh, great power. Uh, in the meantime, we of course can't, can't ignore China. We, we continue to need to have a conversation with China because like any country, China is not a monolith. Sure, there is a particular uh, 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 school of thought uh, in charge at the moment, but we continue to need to talk to China, to put our view to China, uh, and it may well be that uh, down the track, China, China changes. My own analysis is that I expect that things will become worse before they get better. And that lends itself to Australia continuing to start now to look at the need for trade uh, and strategic diversification. That rests easily with uh, the, the adoption of the notion of the Indo-Pacific, which has been Australia's uh, foreign policy and defence strategic outlay since the 2013 Defence White Paper reflected by uh, subsequent Defence and Foreign Policy White Paper. So they're the challenges. Um, that's the environment. Um, and Andrew, I expect that you want me to handball all of the solutions to uh, Senator Wong. Shall I um, jump in now then? <laughs> well, I think Stephen has really summarised, um, you know, the circumstances that we face. Uh, and I was going to you know, basically do what he's done, which is to, to just remind us where we are in uh, at this period in history, because I think it it is useful to um, understand the very different environment in which we're operating. Um, uh, obviously, China has become much more assertive under President Xi, uh, and the that assertiveness, I think, is um, you know, playing out around the world, uh, playing out in terms of its relationship with the United States, and it's playing out particularly in our region where uh, the balance of power is shifting. Uh, and, I'm having a few um, sound interferences. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we are seeing China's assertiveness, not only in our bilateral relationship, but, but throughout, throughout the region. Uh, so and we should pause and recognize that, that is a, a, this is a very new circumstance for Australia. I mean, we are dealing with, I think the most difficult foreign policy environment, probably since the end of World War II, uh, and the confluence of a number of uh, changes. One is, uh, I think, the, the increasing fraying of the multilateral system, uh, the relative position as between our, our central strategic ally, our key strategic ally, the United States and China, and of course, China's assertiveness, both globally and in our region. Uh, so we should assume, I think, uh, that there are notwithstanding the mutually beneficial relationship in, in many ways that we have had with China over the period that Stephen's described and Western Australia really has been at the center of that. We should assume that there will be enduring differences in our bilateral relationship, which will continue to need to be managed in the, in the years to come. Uh, and, you know, I, I agree with Stephen that we need to therefore consider the consequences of that those change circumstances, that, uh, that, that different relationship, China's different position, uh, and work out how we deal with it. Um, I think there's an economic piece to that, which is one, to secure key supply chains. The second is, I think, to diversify our export markets. Uh, it is, um, you know, we are, I think Stephen said, we've got too many eggs in the one basket, and we are actually more dependent 
than pretty much any other nation uh, on China for our export as an export market. And we have become more dependent over the period of the, of the current government. Um, but we also have to focus very much on what sort of region we want, uh, because our region is a focal point of, of much of the strategic competition that people have described. And we need to think through uh, uh, both what and what we want and how we want to achieve that. What do we want? Well, we want a region that is uh, stable and prosperous, but that also respects sovereignty. Uh, that is, we don't want a region which is uh, uh, he he hegemonic. Uh, we also uh, want a region where there are clear rules of the road. So that I suppose is a shorthand way of talking about um, somebody saying, can they see me? My video has been turned off. How's that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we also want a region where the rules of the road, which is, a, as I said, a shorthand way of talking about, you know, rules-based order, where there are, are agreed collective norms uh, and principles whereby disputes uh, and issues are resolved. Uh, at, how do we achieve that? Well, I think um, the way in which we do that is first to work with allied and aligned nations and, you know, foremost amongst those is obviously the United States, but also Japan, Japan and India, as well as uh, South Korea. Uh, and we also need to separately uh, uh, work closely with Southeast Asian nations and ASEAN as entity. Uh, we also have to continue to be and become more active in global institutions. I would make this point, and I try not to be too partisan on foreign policy for obvious reasons, but um, I think that part of why, part of the problem with how the Morrison government has approached much of uh, the diff much of the relationship and, and one of the things that has contributed to an exacerbation of the difficulties uh, is that it has looked to short-term domestic political um, imperatives rather than to taking a very strategic review, review of the relationship. So I think the, the one way in which I'd describe how we might deal with our relationship with China better would be <coughs> more strategy and less politics. Yeah, exactly. So that's my overarching no, summary, no, uh, Andrew and Stephen, uh, and I'm happy to um, uh, you know, have take any further questions or comments that you might want to make and take it from there. I, th I think because of um, sound difficulties, I've, I've been moved to the podium. So um, I'm not sure, Penny, whether you can still see me, but you can see you. I can see you. Okay. okay. All right. So, well, um, firstly, there's, there's not a word that Penny said with which I, I, I don't uh, agree. So in terms of the fundamental circumstance that we find ourselves in, we're, we're in screaming agreement. Um, the question is, what, what, what can we do about it? Firstly, um, I do think we can work closely with the Biden administration, and already you've seen from Biden a much more sophisticated and nuanced view from his administration than you saw from the Trump administration. Uh, and one of the, the uh, real uh, shudders of concern that the Trump administration sent to our part of the world was the United States not consulting with nor dealing with its partners in an appropriate way. Uh, and we saw that in our own instance with the Malcolm Turnbull phone call. But for other countries in our part of the world, it was much more uh, difficult. So Japan, Korea uh, in particular. So um, if you look at the a changing world, sure, the key relationship is United States and China, as has been the case and will continue. But one of the reasons Australia adopted the notion of the Indo-Pacific was that we saw other countries in our part of the world on the rise again. In the first instance, economically, economically, and economic growth subsequently brings with it political growth, strategic power and influence, and ultimately military power and influence. And we've seen that with China itself. We'll see that with India. So in the blink of an eye, India will be the second or third largest economy in the world. And by 2040 to 2050, Indonesia will be the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world. So that's pulling economic and strategic and political and military influence to our part of the world, to Australia, to Southeast Asia, and particularly to Perth and Western Australia, as we face the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean Rim, where the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific. And uh, what we describe as a multipolar world where you've got a range of significant powers. And Penny's also mentioned Japan. We continue to underestimate the, the deep economic and strategic significance that Japan has for us and for our part of the world. 
But you put into that bundle, that mix, Australia, Indonesia, India, Japan, Korea, United States, that works for a country like Australia, large economy, but small population. And we've been very good at getting in on the ground floor, as we did with our China recognition, very good at getting in on the ground floor of, of Southeast Asia and, and uh, ASEAN being ASEAN's first dialogue partner. And so we've worked very hard to try and grow our relationship. So a multipolar world where you've got a mix of influences works for a country like Australia. We have a, a security arrangement or alliance with the United States, also a deep economic relationship in terms of investment with the United States and trying to grow significant economic and strategic relationships with others. Our single biggest um, priority, it seems to me, in addition to uh, China is trying to grow our economic and strategic relationship with India uh, and Indonesia. And there are parts of what we call the regional architecture, which work well for Australia. So Australia, in, in, when Penny and I were last in government, um, uh, uh, we worked very hard to get the United States into uh, what's called the East Asia Summit. And that's now the premier meeting forum in our part, our part of the world. Presidents and prime ministers meeting on an annual basis, foreign ministers meeting annually, and defence ministers meeting every two years, but soon to meet every year. And that's got all of the key countries in our part of the world there, China, US, India, Indonesia, Australia, Japan, Korea, and others. So that's really an important forum for us. And so we've been very good at trying to uh, use regional architecture and use multilateral institutions to make sure that our national security and economic interests are protected and advanced basically since World War II, post-World War II and joining the United Nations with Doc Evert was, was another deeply significant environment. So whilst we're going through a very difficult time um, for a country that's got 25 billion people, largest population center, six or 7 million scattered around a half a dozen coastal population center, we're positioned very well to try and get through a difficult period. Uh, and that requires sort of a strategy, as Penny has said, it also requires subtlety and nuance. And you don't have to be the pointy end of the spear on every on every argument. You can choose your battles and choose your arguments and grow the relationships as they as they come. So Penny, your go. Yeah. So a couple of points I wanted to make. I mean, I think one of the one of the things we also need to do is to think about how we handle our domestic discussion. And I noticed someone in the chat said, "What what do I mean when I say more strategy, less politics?" and uh, what I mean is I, I think that it is very easy to get into a partisan fight or domestic politics around the China relationship. Uh, and the, the most egregious example of that, I think, um, was, for example, Senator Betts's comments where he asked some Chinese Australians before a Senate committee to disavow or put the, the Communist Party um, and make certain, you know, it was... Uh, an example, I think, of, of how not to handle some of the consequences of the challenges in the relationship with China. I think what we should be doing is first, um, trying to have more bipartisan, in, if, if we were in government, what I would want to be doing is to have more bipartisan engagement uh, across the parliament. So parliamentarians, even with different views, had a better sense of the sort of equities we have in the China relationship some of the ways in which uh, we should try and handle the debate and discussion domestically, some of the risks and challenges uh, that we have to deal with, rather than have, um, frankly, people trying to pay uh, some domestic politics with the relationship. So that, that would be the first thing. The second comment I wanted to make uh, was, you know, an example, another example, I think, of some of the problematic handling of the relationship was the Prime Minister's call for weapons inspectors type powers for uh, the World um, Health Organization early on in the pandemic, um, uh, which uh, was never going to happen. And I suspect he probably knew it was never going to happen, but it was something that could be said at the time. Um, I think I, I wanted to make a point about the opportunities of the Biden administration. And, you know, it was uh, I think a great relief to America's allies, regardless of, you know, we're, obviously I'm from, we're from the progressive side of politics, so we have a particular uh, philosophical view, but I think for many of uh, America's allies, it was a great relief to have a return to an administration that actually spoke about the importance of the alliances that America has, uh, rather than denigrating them. Um, uh, 
Kurt Campbell, who has been appointed, um, in, is in the Biden administration, as I think they're calling in the, the Asia czar or something, some, some interesting term like that. But he wrote quite a lot about the importance of finding a, a settling point between the US and China. And I think that's quite a useful way of thinking about um, the sort of balance of powers idea that, that Stephen talked about. In part, what we want to try and get to is uh, a coexistence arrangement as between the US and its allies and China, uh, which is one that does reflect some of the interests and values that we've been describing. Uh, and that's going to take some time to get to that point. Um, and you can see the contest at the moment that already that is you know, in play in terms of the discussion, um, the discussions both publicly and, and um, diplomatically, which are occurring between the Biden administration uh, and the, um, the, the Chinese uh, leadership. Uh, but I think it is critical to the stability of the region that, that the US um, be supported um, by countries like Australia and others uh, to uh, enable that kind of settling point and one that you know, respects the sort of region that we want to be. Well, I think um, Penny's point about um, the, the Biden administration and the fact that very many of the senior officials Australia know as well. So I work very closely with um, with Kurt Campbell when we were doing the arrangements for Obama's visit, which included what we call enhanced operational uh, arrangements under the alliance with the United States. So mar Marines rotating out of Darwin, uh, more utilization of our Northern and Western Air Force bases by US Air Force and ultimately, which still hasn't occurred, but will at some stage, use greater utilization of HMAO Sterling south of Perth and Fremantle. Uh, but Tony Blinken, uh, Jake Sullivan, these are people who, Australian officials have dealt with, Australian members of parliament and ministers, past and, uh, and future have dealt with. And so that puts us in a very good position. Uh, and if you look at the way in which Biden has reached out to those partners, as Penny said, showing great respect to those partners, um, the defence secretary, the secretary of state for defence has gone to India, um, uh, senior officials have gone to Japan and Korea, there's one gap in traffic, and that is, uh, and I asked this question of US officials the other day uh, when I was having a session with them, who can give me the name of the senior US official who's gone to Indonesia? And the answer is no one can because no one senior has gone. And that is that is a gap in traffic. Um, Australia continues to have a deleterious economic relationship with, with Indonesia, and we need to grow that. And the United States has both, has both uh, a lot of work to do on the economic engagement front, but also on the strategic front. So. When we think about some of the uh, recent success stories in terms of, of that multipolar world or dealing with partners, um, we've seen the quad being resuscitated, which is a good thing in the current environment, India, Australia, US and Japan, but we can't, um, we can't neglect our own relationship with Indonesia and we have to influence the United States to pay more attention to Indonesia because Indonesia will be a deeply significant influence, not just in ASEAN, but in, uh, in the globe generally. On Penny's point about um, it works for governments and nations to protect the national interest and the national security interest if you're actually making decisions about these matters that aren't motivated by domestic politics. And rule of thumb, 80 to 90 percent of what we do in, in the national parliament in, in, uh, in these areas, uh, foreign policy, national security and defence, is done on a bipartisan basis. Occasionally, there's a big divide. And so the most recent divide that we've seen, for example, in, in, in uh, the modern era has been uh, Labor's opposition to Australia's intervention in Iraq. Uh, and we're still suffering the adverse consequences of that intervention. So occasionally, you'll get big divides. There's a general proposition. Most of what we do is done by, uh, by bipartisan agreement. Uh, and the last time we saw uh, egg on a government's face by trying to use a domestic political motivation to achieve a, a foreign policy outcome was in um, the by-election following Malcolm Turnbull's retirement, when someone thought it was a good idea to announce that Australia would move its embassy in Israel from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which, which, had, which was motivated by domestic political considerations and backfired completely as it should have. And so trying to make sure that the conversations we have 
as the Americans would say, across the aisle remains deeply important. It was something that, um, that, uh, that I did in government and something which some ministers uh, have done, but I detect from Penny that in recent times that has fallen off a bit. That's not actually a good thing to occur. It's not in our national interest because the more like-minded approach we have in terms of the Australian institutions of power and influence, then the better off we are in these difficult times and difficult areas. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I, I think that's that's particularly so oh, when, okay. sorry, that's particularly so I think when um, you're confronting such a change. Um, and I again, you know, reiterate this, you know, we, we've had, we have had, you know, challenging times post-World War II, but largely we have been in the position where our, our principal ally, uh, our primary strategic partner, has been you know, the world's um, superpower uh, and has underwritten a multilateral system which has largely been uh, a system that accords with Australia's interests and values. Um, China has become more assertive. Um, the US position has, um, relative position has changed. Obviously, um, President Trump also substantially shifted how people thought about uh, the United States' role in the world and the multilateral system is frayed. So when you're dealing with um, uh, a circumstance where much of the old playbook doesn't apply, I think the imperative around trying to engage the community and the other side of politics more deeply uh, is greater. So, so hence my comment earlier about more strategy, less politics, uh, and the importance of, of deeper bipartisan engagement. Um, now, I think there's been a, I'm not sure the extent to Andrew to which you want to respond, me to respond to some of the questions in the chat, or you just want me to keep talking off the top of my head. But um, there are a couple of people in the chat who sort of talked about um, the risk that, you know, strategic risk that China, um, uh, that, that China um, presents. I would make this point. Um, you know, we're getting into, um, it is not in our interests to be part of escalating competition between the great powers. Uh, we've given uh, bipartisan support to the government's um, defence initiatives. Uh, we have uh, backed um, the additional investment and capability. We've made criticisms about some of the, the government's choices around that, and Stephen can talk a lot more about some of the implementation of that and the challenges. But I think uh, we equally have to invest also in our influence uh, in the region in terms of our diplomacy and our soft power. Um, Defence spending and capability is of critical importance, and there's bipartisan support around that but it isn't enough uh, to deal with the sorts of challenges we're facing uh, of its, on itself, of its, of, on its own. Uh, and um, I would be, uh, Stephen spoke about Indonesia, he's right on that, we're underdone in that relationship. Uh, I've been critical of the way in which the government has reduced um, our, our overseas development assistance uh, by something like $12 billion over the period they've been in government. Uh, they have funded their Pacific step up with the Southeast Asian step down. And I think those are actions which are not consistent or consonant with Australia's, the imperative of Australia's interests in the region. Part of how we have to manage uh, the sort of disruption and change that we're describing is to uh, work harder in our region uh, and more closely with the, with the nations uh, who seek the same sort of region and rules of the road that Australia does. So, Penny, I think we've got about five minutes to go before okay. we're going to get some questions, but I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to a couple of your comments, and I'm going to ask you a question myself, so I get in first. But um, you, you spoke about the, the government funding the so-called Pacific step up by a Southeast Asian step down. Now, the way I articulate that is that we've had um, an Indo-Pacific strategic framework as the guiding principle for Australian foreign and defence policy since uh, 2013. Um, I see plenty of activity on the Pacific side, but I still see neglect on the Indo side. So to me, there's much more work needs to be done on the Indo, Indo side of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, 
Um, and that is not just how we utilise defence assets in and uh, within Western Australia. It's also the economic relationships that we try to uh, try to uh, forge. Um, and whilst um, uh, the Western Australian economy has been very prosperous off the back of iron ore and liquefied natural gas to Japan, Korea and China. Historically, um, we now need to make sure that we're leading the way in terms of our economic relationships with South Asia, which is primarily India, but, but uh, other, other areas of South Asia as well, including Sri Lanka, and then into uh, Southeast Asia, in particular Indonesia. But the other growing tiger where we have a particular... Um, uh, good um, capacity to, to uh, grow a relationship is with Vietnam. So Vietnam, a country of 100 million people, the, the government of Vietnam and the Communist Party of Vietnam really wanting to grow the Vietnamese um, economy um, regards Australia very well. And so there are lots of economic opportunities around there, which also work in, in, in what, what I describe as a, a multipolar world, but there's a lot of work to be done on the Indo-Pacific, on the Indo side of the Indo-Pacific. But Penny, my, my question to you was, you know, you've been shadow minister for, for um, uh, into your se second term. Um, most advice to people who, and you've been a minister before, so you can give your own advice, but most advice to people who want to become ministers is when you, when you become a minister and you sit behind a desk, you open the palm of your hand, and you've got the three to five things written down which you want to achieve uh, because that's the, the best way of trying to get something done that you want to do on your own terms. So to what extent have you got penciled in on your palm or written in on your, on your palm the, the one, two, three, four or five things that you think are absolutely essential for you as a minister in, in, um, in the next, the next uh, Labor government to achieve on the foreign policy front? Uh, well, I think for me, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, how, how is it, how, how can we really um, not just more deeply engage uh, but work much more closely with and have much greater influence with um, key nations in Southeast Asia, and I agree with you about Vietnam. Uh, I want to rebuild Australia's development assistance program and through that I think Australia's um, soft power and place in the world. Um, and I think climate um, which is you know, such, a, such a key imperative. As you know, I was climate minister. Um, uh, I think there's so much unfinished business there, but I also think it's so central uh, to Australia's standing in our region and internationally. I mean, I, you will recall, Stephen, how closely we work with both Indonesia but also Pacific Island nations in the multilateral in the UN arrangements on climate and how important that was not only to our, our role within the UN negotiations but also to our standing in the region. And, you know, I think it is a great regret that Australia's relationships with those, you know, with the Pacific Island nations in particular, but also our standing um, more broadly has been so denigrated by a government uh, that has taken the irrational position on climate that it, that it has. So that'd be the sort of uh, three that I, off the top of my head, uh, indicate. Thank you very much, um, Senator Wong and Professor Smith. There have been a lot of questions coming through, so I'd like to thank everyone for sending those questions through. We are, we're on one mic up here now, so I might just ask the question and then, and then step aside. The first question, which I thought was interesting to broaden out the conversation a little bit, was regarding that we've talked a lot about security and economics, but on what areas can we deepen the relationship with China? On which areas, policy areas, can we collaborate more strongly? So the suggestion here was scientific research. Can we talk a little bit more about some of these uh, areas of collaboration? Well, I mean, obviously climate is one where we do have, oh, sorry, Stephen, did you want to go first? I've just jumped in. And I, I wanted you to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look, I, I mean, it's, yeah, you're, I, I mean, I think, there's been such a focus in, in, in terms of our domestic discussion, foreign, foreign policy and strategic discussion on the things that are difficult in the relationship. Um, I, I think we, are, we, we, we have found it harder to focus on what we can do together. And we, we do need to do that because we, you know, we, we're not in a position where we would, should seek to nor want to de decouple. I mean, China's not going anywhere. And whilst we have 
quite very quite significant and fundamental differences, quite substantial and fundamental differences with uh, with China on on a number of fronts. You know, disengagement isn't an option for us. So the the question for us is how do we better engage? Uh, climate is an obvious one on research and so forth. Can I can I come up a level and make this point? When the government um, passed its uh, foreign relations bill, which enabled veto of um, arrangements that state governments, territory governments, local governments, universities, etc., could would could have with uh, other nations, in, you know, obviously including uh, China. The point I made was, was this: uh, we should be focusing on how we enhance our national resilience uh, and the resilience of our key institutions, our parliaments, our legislatures. Uh, our governments, whether it's council, uh, you know, our governance bodies, whether it's local councils or all the federal parliament or our, and our universities. And part of enhancing that resilience is actually making sure we work with those institutions to, to talk to them about what we can do as well as what we can't. So rather than simply saying we don't want you to engage at all or we, be, we, we are clear about the terms on which we should be engaging. Uh, and that's not a conversation I think that we are sufficiently having. Uh, and I think it's in part because the, the government wanted a, you know, a quick response or a, you know, a very public response, for example, on the BRI, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but it is very important that we think through in quite a granular way, what are the areas in which we do want to engage and what is, you know, what is the advice of government or the thinking of, of those who think through these strategic issues about the boundaries around that? But the, 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 the area where we, we, we have to engage because of the existential imperative for humanity is obviously climate. And you know, I, think, I, think, um, I think China is aware of that. And you've, you saw, I think it was earlier this week, China's indication about its willingness to cooperate with the United States in relation to climate. Interestingly, the minister who I dealt with when I was climate minister, Xie Jinhua, has now been uh, has made a comeback in China and is, is now engaged on climate policy. So he does actually know a lot about it, and I hope we you know we can see some productive engagement between uh, particularly China and the US, but in the in the multilateral area. Well, as Penny says, the climate change is the obvious area. There are some things which countries or a small number of countries can do by themselves, but there are some issues where only the vast bulk of countries acting together can make can make progress. So climate change is the obvious area where we can have a conversation with China. And as Penny says, the US and China reflected that earlier in the week. I think the other area where we should not relent or give up is, is in our economic relationship. Yes, we have we have difficulties at the moment, but if you go back to the last time we had two great powers who were in strategic competition, uh, the, the Soviet Union and the United States uh, in the aftermath of World War II. Um, the difference between that um, uh, Cold War and the strategic competition we have now is that next to no one uh, in our part of the world had an economic relationship with the Soviet Union. It was all ideological. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, when the Berlin Wall went, fell over and the Soviet Union collapsed, that had no deleterious economic impact on, on Australia because we had next to no economic relationship with the Soviet Union. The difference now is that uh, China has an economic relationship with just about every country in the world, including being the largest trading partner for about 200 of them. So I don't characterise what we're currently going through as a Cold War. I describe it as a small C, small W Cold War with economic characteristics. In other words, there, there is strategic competition. Uh, between the US and China and between China and other countries. But there's uh, an inextricably interwoven economic relationship between the vast bulk of countries in our part of the, part of the world. Um, a US interlocutor once said to me, he said, Stephen, you've, you've got a very deep relationship with uh, China that causes us concern, to which my response was the only economic relationship that I'm aware of that is more engaged than Australia and China's is the United States and China's. And that still continues. And so because of that eco economic intermingling and dependency, you've got to have a conversation with China about matters economic. Um, and there's no point in disengaging. And even if we think the conversation might be fruitless, you've still got to have it. But at some point in the cycle, something will change. Uh, and so climate change, and ob the obvious one, uh, economic relationship, um, uh, uh, very important to try and continue. Just 
a slight sort of deviation. We of course talk about the strategic competition with China causing us difficulty on the economic front and the need to diversify for a whole range of reasons. Climate change, of course, presents us with the most compelling, compelling reason that we need to diversify our economy. Australian prosperity since the end of World War II has been built off uh, the export of iron ore, coal and liquefied natural gas to Northeast Asia, Japan, China and Korea. Uh, over the next three decades, as a result of climate change, not as a result of our relationship with China or anyone else, those industries will be on a decline and potentially some of them a sharp decline. It took us 30 years from the, the commerce agreement with Japan in 1957 to the late 1980s to get critical mass into those industries and those relationships. It'll take us 30 years to be, to be successful on what we need to do to replace those, those uh, economic contributions, otherwise our prosperity will fall. So that's the great economic challenge for Australia, in my view, and particularly Western Australia, where where uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of our exports are one commodity to one country. So that's the big economic challenge in my view is that how do we diversify our economy and find the scale and the critical mass to substitute for, a, for an inexorable downturn in coal, iron ore and LNG. Penny, I think we've got time for one more question to you. Is that right? Before you have to bid us farewell. Uh, a question's come through from uh, from somebody which I think is keenly felt from and by a lot of people, a lot of Australians of Asian heritage, and that is essentially that the tenor of the national discourse mm -hmm. over the last few years has impacted them uh, and not in a good way. Uh, a lot of them have been subject, they believe, because of the nature of our national discourse by increased levels of, of racism. Um, what would be your response to that and what can be done to address this? Uh, well, I think that's undeniably the case. Regrettably, I think it is undeniably the case that uh, some of the uh, discussion, debate, some of the um, some of what has been said by certain politicians um, uh, has been deleterious to to you know, acceptance, inclusion, uh, and uh, to community, uh, I suppose, harmony. Um, there has, I think, demonstrably been an increase in uh, experience of and reporting of uh, you know, racist behaviours, actions, abuse, etc. Et cetera. And I, I always try to um, remind you know, my colleagues, but my parliamentary colleagues, but also more broadly, we know that Values of inclusion and, and respect require ongoing um, leadership uh, from people across the community, whether they're people in our parliaments or, or people who are community leaders in other respects. So when you get parliamentarians saying some of the things that you've seen people like George Christensen or Eric Abed say, uh, I am unsurprised, although distressed, about the way in which that plays into some of our community relationships. So what do we have to do about it? This is, this is a, a, a big challenge. Um, uh, and it requires, I think, more leadership than we've seen uh, from the current government. I think we need to be really clear to differentiate between our concerns about the uh, actions uh, and stance of the Chinese Communist Party uh, and uh, our view about people of Chinese heritage. Uh, secondly, we should be um, absolutely resolute and hard line about any kind of you know, McCarthyist or other uh, tendency uh, being part of the debate. Uh, I referenced earlier Erica Betts's demand that some Chinese Australians disavow the Chinese Communist Party in a parliamentary hearing. I, I thought that was disgraceful uh, and he should have been uh, far more condemned, frankly, um, than he was. And I thought well, I gave Maurice Payne the opportunity to condemn it and, and she failed to do so. And I think, you know, in those circumstances, leaders have to have to be prepared to demonstrate, you know, <laughs> doing more than just express sort of toe a party line. They actually have to, to express the values of the nation. Finally, I think it is 
in, in terms of the public discussion and in the media, we have to be really clear what the guardrails are. We, we can never, we can have a discussion about the strategic challenges that um, China um, uh, generates or, or China, China poses, but we should never degenerate or allow that to go into, um, you know, to, to transgress into racism, to prejudice, or to a suggestion of that, that, you know, where people have a different view that they might not be somehow loyal to Australia. I don't know why my video keeps being turned off, but it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Senator Wong. Do you have time for one more question or is this, uh, is this the end of the road? For I just, I, I can be very, if I, I'll, I'll try to be quick in my response. I'm sorry. Okay, I was well, I'll try and be quick in asking the question then. Um, how does Australia maintain a strong economic relationship with China whilst putting pressure uh, on it for human rights violations in Xinjiang and elsewhere? Oh, look, that is challenging if, if China chooses to be um, take an economically coercive um, approach. You know, so, I mean, the, the relationship is involves more than one party. Um, I did give a speech this week where I spoke about Xinjiang, and, and the point I made is, you know, we, we, are, um, we have certain values and interests as a liberal democracy, uh, and, you know, those value and interests, I think, do... Um, uh, mean we have to speak in a way that is consistent and principled uh, about human rights uh, and you know, at times that will be difficult uh, and that will be one of the areas where which will contribute to the sorts of differences in the relationship. Um, uh, you know, I, I ultimately um, you know it's a decision that um, both parties have to make whether or not we seek to manage those differences or not um, you know, a, a Labor government would seek to manage those differences and we'd be open to the dialogue, but we, we are not going to walk away from our long-standing commitment to international law and human rights. Senator Wong, thank you very much for your time. You've gone above and beyond. So I think, uh, Stephen, on indulgence, you'll stay for a few yeah. more minutes to answer questions, but uh, could I just have a round of applause for Senator Wong? For thank you very much for the opportunity. I uh, really appreciate it. Okay, talk to you later. So uh, we've got a few of the tough questions, so I thought I'd leave them to you at the end. Um, <laughs> one, one question relating and riffing off um, the previous one, which was asked by Kieran about, I guess, a principled foreign policy and how that, how that might interact with our economic interests. This question, I, I think, which is asked by John, speaks to, I, I guess, whether or not we can maintain a consistent... Um, principled position on these things without actually addressing some of our own policies in terms of asylum seekers. And indeed, if I could go one step further, being consistent in our approach and our comments around, around other countries and their positions on human rights. Okay. Well, when you, when you enjoin the international human rights conversation, you're always at risk of people drawing attention to your own nation's failings. And, and, and we, we have our own as, as any country does. So, we're a, a colonial creation, and there's a lot more work that we need to do on our relationship with uh, First Nations people. We've made some progress in terms of uh, native title. Uh, we've made some progress in terms of, of uh, health and education, but we're still, there's still tremendous gaps as we discover every year when the, 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 the uh, Bridge the Gap reports come through in the parliament. So we have a lot of work to do in our own backyard, but we, we are a modern, sophisticated, multicultural country. Uh, we've got countries from all continents in the world who've come and settled here. Uh, and uh, we are a Western liberal democracy in Asia. We're trying to make ourselves more um, familiar to uh, our Indo-Pacific and Asian neighborhood uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, but we should not be shy about standing up and pointing out breaches of human rights when, when we, we are confronted with them. And, and what has occurred in Xinjiang is on any measure, uh, a matter of enormous international and Australian concern. Uh, and so we can't uh, be backward and coming forward. In the end, uh, whilst it is the case that Australia and all other countries uh, trade, uh, from time to time they refuse to trade or they have trade sanctions or embargoes or the like, where egregious behaviour is committed. Now, 
uh, that's in the exception rather than the norm, uh, but we are entitled to and obliged to make our remarks about um, uh, what we see as breaches of uh, human rights uh, throughout the globe, just as we are obliged to repair our own failings historically, uh, uh, and we need to do that, um, and we need to do that assiduously. There's another, another question, and having travelled to China a wee bit in my last role, you, you hear this quite often, this question of, you know, our references to an international rules-based order and China not necessarily participating in the development of those rules. Um, how do you address that or how did you address that when you were engaging with your counterparts in China as Foreign Minister? Well, the point I made earlier, really, um, uh, I, I became foreign minister at the end of 2007 and was foreign minister till uh, 2010 and then defence minister 2013. So I dealt with my Chinese interlocutors across that period. Um, uh, and our relationship with China was then defined by what I sort of described earlier, I think, sort of the, what we used to call the, the responsible stakeholder thesis. Bob Zalek, who was a assistant secretary of state for the United States, essentially had a thesis which was China is not going to become a liberal democracy. It'll be run by the Communist Party of China, but it will abide by the norms that we've become accustomed to. Uh, or uh, other, other analysts describe the Deng Xiaoping consensus. And Deng Xiaoping, when he was president of China, if there was a problem which was going to cause consternation in the international community, he would manage to kick the can down the road. So that approach from China disappeared 2013-2014. And, so, and it was still present in terms of the Australian psyche in November 2014 when Xi Jinping visited here, but that's now gone. So my conversations with Chinese interlocutors were about what we did, what we regarded as the rules of rules of the road. Whilst China certainly made representations in those years about South China seas, it had not engaged in the activities which we've seen subsequently, which is effectively militarization of some of the shoals in the South China Sea. So that game is much more is much more difficult. But when we talk about the international rules of the road or a rules based order, we're essentially talking about all of the international uh, economic and strategic um, underpinnings which emerged post World War Two. So the creation of a World Bank, the, the creation of the United Nations, uh, the establishment of multilateral trading organisations leading to the World Trade Organisation. And you might remember, some of you weren't born then, some of you are old enough to remember that in the 1990s, um, Australia and other countries essentially said China should become a member of the World Trade Organization. Now, one of the requirements for entering the World Trade Organization is that you have a market-based economy. China did not then, nor does it now, have a market-based economy other than in parts. But we turned a blind eye to that requirement because it was in the global community's interest to have China part of the World Trade Organization to trade by the established rules of the rules of the road. And on any measure, a range of the economic punishment or economic coercion measures that China has engaged in on the trade front with Australia over the last 12 months, whether it's barley or wine or whatever, are WTO inconsistent. In other words, they're in breach of the requirements and the rules of the World Trade Organization. So China did not have a role in those creation, but it has input and Im impact now. Um, China, of course, is, is for historical reasons, a member of the, of the uh, Security Council, one of the, 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 the five permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations. Um, and it certainly has an influence on, on that front. But that's not to say that the rules of the road should remain unchanged, that there can't, that there can't be and isn't, uh, aren't different ways of doing things. But the fundamental fabric that was established post-World War II in terms of trying to retain peace and security through the UN and regional institutions, trying to instill economic prosperity by opening up trade, opening up financial services and the like, they've been very good for Australia and very good for China and very good for the rest of the world in terms of livelihood and economic prosperity. The challenge for us is how do we keep that economic prosperity going for Australia and for our part of the world? I think... Uh hopefully got time for a couple more uh, questions. Um, haven't bumped into each other yet, which is which is good. I think my last job we used to call this bruise free footy where you dance around each other without any contact. Um, statecraft, um, is there 
a common characteristic that you would define as Australian statecraft? Is there an element that would, a common connection between the statecraft as executed by Andrew Peacock, Gareth Evans, Alexander Downer, yourself? And how would you define this Chinese statecraft? Well, I think historically Australia has done very well on the, the foreign policy uh, and, the, and the trade front. So foreign affairs and trade, um, we've done very well in that. And, and we, we, we've done very well in that because we've, we, we've always been good at picking and picking early um, geostrategic <laughs> change. And we've been good at associating ourselves with a large uh, and like-minded power. So historically, that was the UK for all of the obvious sort of colonial and historical reasons. <laughs> Post-World War II, it was the United, the United States. In terms of regions, we were at the, at the, at the heart of the creation of the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, we supported uh, the um, creation of ASEAN. And we, as I said earlier, I think ASEAN's first dialogue partner. We've also been very good at influencing um, other countries uh, into, a, into a particular foreign policy framework or approach um, and uh, being able to do that in, in a subtle way. And so we, for example, were very influential in persuading the United States that they should sign up for the uh, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which is a requirement to become uh, a, uh, a member of ASEAN or a dialogue partner of ASEAN and then join the East Asia Summit. And that was Australia persuading Hillary Clinton um, as Secretary of State, and then Obama, that, that ongoing US engagement in our part of the world was essential, and that needed to be reflected by what had been a change in, in our regional architecture, and they did that. So we've been very good at influencing large powers. Um, and uh, whilst you know the, the common um, uh, unfair, untrue, but generally perceived response uh, uh, about Australian foreign policy is that we only ever do what the United States tell us. We have actually very robust conversations um, behind closed doors, uh, don't do things which the United States think that we should do, uh, and persuade them of the sanctity of our view. So without telling tales out of school, when I was negotiating with Hillary Clinton and Kurt Campbell about the, the, the nature of uh, the, enhanced, uh, the enhanced alliance arrangements, uh, in Darwin, we made the point very clearly to the United States that we don't have US bases in Australia. We have joint facilities and there's a small number of them. And that the US Marines in Darwin would not be a US base. They would rotate in and out uh, with our permission. Uh, and it took a while before the penny dropped with Kurt that the notion of no US bases in Australia was something that had been uh, of great attachment to Australia uh, since, since the early 1970s. So we do have influence. The other thing, we have been good uh, as well at seeing where the, where the turns are coming, where, where's the next economic or strategic influence. And when we started um, our, what we call Indo-Pacific um, analysis, I'd go to India, to Indonesia, go to ASEAN meetings, go everywhere and say, you know, we, we think we should start not talking about the Asia-Pacific, but the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and and everyone, for everyone from Delhi to Jakarta would scratch their heads and say, well, what's this all about? And we would say, look, it's all about, look at India's economic rise, look at Indonesia's economic rise, look at ASEAN's economic rise. This is where movement will be. It won't just be US and, and China. And that took us a long period of time to, to get traction on that. Now, everyone's got an Indo-Pacific policy, an Indo-Pacific strategy. So the Indians have got one, the ASEANs have got one, the Japanese have got one, um, the Europeans have got one, the French have got one, the Brits have got one. And if you read their documents, you'd be forgiven for thinking that they thought it was their idea, you know, <laughs> that, that we had nothing to do with it. Well, that's fine. We don't care who gets credit. The Indians give credit to a retired vice admiral who sort of mentioned uh, the notion of the Indo-Pacific in, in an arcane article that he did some time ago. Uh, but we've also been very good at... at, at getting people and nations to come to a conclusion that, that a framework or a structure we've been, we've been um, promoting or, uh, or uh, considering is worth broader consideration. So, and what I, uh, you know, Penny's point earlier about most of what we do in this area uh, either is not or shouldn't be domestic partisan relationship. What I, what I, when I look back at what I inherited and what, what, what 
um, came after my time as foreign minister and, and it equally applies in defence because there is a very big element in defence of what we call defence diplomacy, which I won't digress on. But I found that a lot of the things that you do in foreign policy, you're putting a brick upon a structure that people before you have helped to establish. And occasionally you get the joy of putting the final brick on and getting credit for all of the work that came before you. But a whole range of things that we do uh, is a is a Australian foreign policy brick that's put on top of a, another piece of infrastructure, which eventually comes to fruition. And so, uh, most foreign ministers basically inherit and add to the work that their predecessors ha have done, and that's an unambiguously good thing. It doesn't occur necessarily in domestic portfolios, um, although there are some things which are now so embedded with our domestic fabric that they're that they're here forever. So. Again, some of us in the room are old enough to know, know when, um, when Medibank and Medicare was a, a great partisan divide and now it's just accepted as part of our fabric. I think we're out of time. So um, please join me in thanking, uh, particular thanks to Professor Smith. It's been an illuminating evening. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks very much for that. I know Penny would have enjoyed that. And uh, Andrew spoke about sort of, you know, um, body contact free football. Andrew, as you may know, is, uh, is rusted on port. So I finished by saying go port, go Dockers. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs>